Idol idolatry, how idolatry crept into Christianity. Idolatry, part one of five. Description, the meaning of a worship. It is a strange irony that those who reverence stones live in glass ideologies. L. Brown. Idolatry, every monotheist abhors the thought, and yet many commit the crime themselves. Few today fully grasp the complexities of this issue, for the definition of idolatry has been buried beneath nearly 1,700 years of church tradition. The second commandment states, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, Exodus 20 verses 4 and 5. Alternate translations employ slightly different, though significant, wording, as for example, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, NRSV, NIV. The commandment not to make carved images speaks for itself, as does the subsequent decree not to make any likeness whatsoever. These directives could not be clearer. It is man's nature, however, to seek loopholes in laws, taxes, and scripture. Consequently, there are those who consider the initial order not to make carved images, or any likeness of anything, conditional upon the following decree not to serve or worship the images, the argument being that if nobody actually worships the image itself, then it's permissible to make it. But that's not what the commandment says. And in any case, caution dictates avoiding what God has forbidden, for the one who trespasses can expect to be held accountable. But let's take a step backward. What do the words serve and worship really mean? The verb to serve, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, means to give the service and respect due to a superior. Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. 1997, 10th edition. Merriam-Webster, Inc. So, if placing images in exalted positions, statues of saints literally placed upon pedestals, religious icons framed, etc., spending time, energy and money to dust, clean, beautify, and preserve them are not acts of service and respect, what are? The typical Christian response? That these acts of service are not acts of worship. Now, wait a minute. The word worship wasn't even around 2,000 years ago. In fact, it wasn't around 1,000 years ago. It didn't exist in the English language during the period of Revelation, even if the New Testament had been written in English, which it wasn't. So what words were available in biblical times? What is the meaning from which the word worship was derived? Not surprisingly, we trace the word worship back to a sense of having worth, a sense of worthiness. Worship began life as a compound noun meaning virtually a worthiness. It was formed from the adjective worth and the noun suffix ship, state, condition, and at first was used for distinction. Credit, dignity. This soon passed into a respect, reverence, but it was not used in specifically religious contexts until the 13th century. The verb dates from the 12th century, Edo, John. 1991, Bloomsbury Dictionary of Word Origins. London, Bloomsbury Publishing Limited. And this from the New Catholic Encyclopedia. Worship, in Anglo-Saxon, weirsip meant a worthship, in which a worth is to be understood in the sense of value or honor. Worship, therefore, originally meant the state of worth, the quality of being valuable or worthy. New Catholic Encyclopedia. 1967, Washington, D.C. The Catholic University of America. Volume 14, page 1030. So what does the second commandment really say? Not only should one not bow or pray to man-made images, in the manner of many Catholics, but one should not even value these images. But we don't value them, the average Christian responds. Oh, really? Well, in that case, you won't mind if we just toss them into the garbage or flush them down the toilet. I mean, they're worthless, right? Without value, right? And what do we do with worthless things? We throw them away, don't we? The point is that, yes, Christians value their images, and in this manner they violate the second commandment. Does idolatry manifest itself in other ways? Sure. Ever wonder why people used to, and in some cases, still do put greet upper-tier clergy, royalty, and members of the social elite as your worship? By this phrase. Commoners venerate men and women of high worth, position, and social status. So is that worship? According to the definition of the word, yes. Your worship meant your worthiness and conveyed the distinction of high value. So does this mean the commoners who used this phrase worship those they addressed in such a manner?
Not only did they worship them, they idolized them, and we see this dynamic applied as much to music, sports, and movie stars in the present day as we do to clergy, royalty, and the social elite. Oh, come on, you might say, you're being ridiculous. No, I'm being precise. I'm not saying God has forbidden us to honor such individuals, I'm just saying that, yes, addressing individuals in such terms as your worship is a form of worship. However, where this crosses the line into the forbidden zone is when people revere others as gods, or grant them the honor and respect reserved for our Creator. Should they prefer these individuals' guidance to the laws and guidance of revelation, they usurp God's authority. Likewise, should they revere such an individual by, oh let's say, claiming him to be infallible or by bowing down to him, even if just to kiss his ring? They grant him the rights and special honor reserved for Almighty God. In this manner, idolatry does not require a statue, although statues certainly heighten the offense. After all, idolatry refers to the worship of gods other than the one, true God, and the use of images is characteristic of the life of the heathen. Ibid, Volume 7, page 348. It is interesting to have a Catholic encyclopedia provide such a definition, isn't it? Why, we don't even need to read between the lines to realize it is self-condemning. Unfortunately, many modern Christian denominations justify their practices more on the basis of tradition than scripture. Rarely is scripture given priority over tradition. Examples do exist, however. As recently as the 1500s, the Nestorian Christians of the Malabar coast in India were presented with an image of the Virgin Mary for the first time. Largely sheltered from European influence, these Malabar Coast Christians had remained ignorant of the changes instituted by the various councils and synods of the European churches. Only with the establishment of sea routes in the 16th century did the two begin to interact. As Edward Gibbon noted, their separation from the Western world had left them in ignorance of the improvements or corruptions of a thousand years. And their conformity with the faith and practice of the 5th century would equally disappoint the prejudices of a papist or a Protestant, Gibbon, Edward, ESQ 1854. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. London, Henry G. Bone. Volume 5, Chapter 47, Page 263. So how did they respond when presented with an image of the Virgin Mary? The title of Mother of God was offensive to their ear, and they measured with scrupulous avarice the honors of the Virgin Mary whom the superstition of the Latins had almost exalted to the rank of a goddess. When her image was first presented to the disciples of St. Thomas, they indignantly exclaimed, We are Christians, not idolaters. Ibid. 7 Ibid, Chapter 49, Page 359. Idolatry, Part 2 of 5. Description, Introduction of Pictures and Sculptures in the Church and the Beginning of Image Worship. It is worth noting that these Malabar Coast Christians were neither incorrect nor alone in their views. The primitive Christians were possessed with an unconquerable repugnance to the use and abuse of images, and this aversion may be ascribed to their descent from the Jews and their enmity to the Greeks. The Mosaic Law had severely proscribed all representations of the deity, and that precept was firmly established in the principles and practice of the chosen people. The wit of the Christian apologists was pointed against the foolish idolaters, who bowed before the workmanship of their own hands, the images of brass and marble, which had they been endowed with sense and motion, should have started rather from the pedestal to adore the creative powers of the artist. Ibid, chapter 49, page 359. Or, to put it in simpler and more modern English. The primitive Christians had attacked image worship as the work of the devil and there had been wholesale destruction of every type of idol, when Christianity had at last triumphed. But over the succeeding centuries, the images crept back, appearing under new names but, to the critical eye, with an identical role. It was the Christians of the East who first began to feel that much of the pagan religion that their forefathers had destroyed, at such cost in martyrs' blood, was insensibly being restored, Chamberlain, E. R. 1993. The Bad Popes. Barnes and Noble Incorporated, P. 11. Religious art nonetheless was approved at the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, and idol worship invaded Catholic services from that time on. Gibbon comments. At first the experiment was made with caution and scruple and the venerable pictures were discreetly allowed to instruct the ignorant, to awaken the cold, and to gratify the prejudices of the heathen proselytes. By a slow though inevitable progression, the honors of the original were transferred to the copy, the devout Christian pray before the image of a saint, and the pagan rites of genuflection, luminaries, and incense, again stole into the Catholic Church, Gibbon, Edward, ESQ. Volume 5, Chapter 49, Page 361. Given time, Gibbon continues. 
the worship of images had stolen into the church by insensible degrees, and each petty step was pleasing to the superstitious mind, as productive of comfort and innocent of sin. But in the beginning of the 8th century, in the full magnitude of the abuse, the more timorous Greeks were awakened by an apprehension that, under the mask of Christianity, they had restored the religion of their fathers, they heard, with grief and impatience, the name of idolaters. The incessant charge of the Jews and Mohammedans, who derived from the law and the Quran an immortal hatred to graven images and all relative worship, Ibid, page 365. All whose Christianity was based upon scripture, apostolic example, and the teachings of the prophets opposed the introduction of idol worship. Hence, when Emperor Constantine's congruently named sister, Constantina, requested a representation of Jesus Christ in 326 CE, Eusebius of Nicomedia answered haughtily, What? And what kind of likeness of Christ is there? Such images are forbidden by the Second Commandment. Hodgkin, Thomas. 1967, Italy and her invaders. Volume 6, Book 7. New York, Russell and Russell. Page 431. Over two centuries ago, Joseph Priestley penned a summary that not only explained the history, but also the reason for this corruption of Christian orthodoxy. Temples being now built in honor of particular saints, and especially, the martyrs. It was natural to ornament them with paintings and sculptures representing the great exploits of such saints and martyrs. And this was a circumstance that made the Christian churches still more like the heathen temples, which were also adorned with statues and pictures. And this also would tend to draw the ignorant multitude to the new worship, making the transition the easier. Paulinus, a convert from paganism, a person of senatorial rank, celebrated for his parts and learning, and who died afterwards Bishop of Nola in Italy, distinguished himself in this way. He rebuilt, in a splendid manner, his own episcopal church, dedicated to Felix the Martyr, and in the porticos of it, he had painted the miracles of Moses and of Christ. Together with the acts of Felix and of other martyrs, whose relics were deposited in it. This, he says, was done with a design to draw the rude multitude, habituated to the profane rites of paganism, to a knowledge and good opinion of the Christian doctrine. By learning from those pictures what they were not capable of learning from books, of the lives and acts of Christian saints. The custom of having pictures in churches being once begun, which was about the end of the 4th or the beginning of the 5th century. And generally by converts from paganism, the more wealthy among the Christians seem to have vied with each other, who should build and ornament their churches in the most expensive manner. And nothing perhaps contributed more to it than the example of this Paulinus. It appears from Chrysostom that pictures and images were to be seen in the principal churches of his time, but this was in the East. In Italy, they were but rare in the beginning of the 5th century, and the bishop of that country, who had got his church painted, thought proper to make an apology for it. By saying that the people being amused with the pictures would have less time for regaling themselves. The origin of this custom was probably in Cappadocia, where Gregory Nicenus was bishop. The same who commended Gregory Thaumaturgus for contriving to make the Christian festivals resemble the pagan ones. Though many churches in this age were adorned with the images of saints and martyrs, there do not appear to have been many of Christ. These are said to have been introduced by the Cappadocians, and the first of these were only symbolical ones, being made in the form of a lamb. One of this kind Epiphanius found in the year 389, and he was so provoked at it, that he tore it. It was not till the Council of Constantinople, called in Trullo, held as late as the year 707 CE, that pictures of Christ were ordered to be drawn in the form of men, priestly, Joseph, ll.d. f.r.s. 1782, An History of the Corruptions of Christianity. Birmingham, Piercy and Jones. Volume 1, The History of Opinions Relating to Saints and Angels, Section 1, Part 2, of Pictures and Images in Churches. Pages 337, 339.